it's me, Tara, the Mud Creek Stitcher. I am finally back for another uh, Bible study. Oh, school's begun. It's begun. Work. Back to work. So uh, I did try and do a Bible study last weekend and realized nothing recorded when I got done. So uh, I walked away. <laughs> so I'm back and I'm going to redo it and I'm checking to make sure it's recording and it is. My dog is in here so I may have to stop. She's being very needy right now because I just got home from school. Uh, we get out early on Fridays so it's always a joyous occasion if I can actually get out early which this time I actually could but normally it doesn't always happen. So anyways hope your uh, week has been going well. Hope you have a nice uh, Labor Day weekend that is relaxing and not stressful or fun, whatever you want to do, I guess. So, anyways, just like I'm going to talk to my dog. No, lay down. Lay down. She doesn't like that. All right, so back to where I tried again, where I'm trying again now. Elijah, if you don't know, I've been doing Elijah for quite a while now, it feels like. Um, you can go back and start on, I think it's Floss Tube 8 or 9, where I try and do it. And I decided to make it separate from my Floss Tube because it's just too overwhelming, I think. And people aren't necessarily interested in that. So I thought we'll separate it out. Okay, so we are on day 4, page 135. A person's pride will humble him, but a humble spirit will gain honor. Proverbs 29:23. I admire confidence in other people, especially a strong, understated type. These kinds of folks don't have to say it, you see it. The quiet humility of their actions speaks louder than any pompous words ever could. A visible willingness to defer to others and deflect attention. They're not pushovers, far from it. They just know who they are. They know who they belong to. They know the power that is theirs because of that relationship. And they know who can send the fire. For me personally, when I see modern day Elijah standing securely in the face of overwhelming life challenges or even just a daily dilemma, all while maintaining a sense of peace and decorum, even a measure of joy, I am convicted and inspired. Despite all they're facing, they have no doubt they're on the winning side. And even as they navigate and painstakingly negotiate their daily realities, they carry a steady assurance that remains with them and emanates through them. Like the Old Testament prophet Elijah, he knew he was on the winning side. He felt no need to vie for attention or compete for first place. He was thankful and trusting that Yahweh had his back. This steely confidence is actually one of the main things that first attracted me to Elijah, and it has compelled me to want to study his life and emulate his example. So start today's lesson by reading the following section from our key passage this week, 1 Kings 18. It is printed for you on the next page. Here, Elijah was laying out the terms of the contest to all those gathered on Mount Carmel. Israel on one side, the pagan prophets on the other, underline all the portions that di display Elijah's confidence. So page 136. Here is the scripture. Let two bulls be given to us. They are to choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces, and place it on the wood, but not light the fire. I'll prepare the other bull and place it on the wood, but not light the fire. Then you call on the name of your God, and I'll call on the name of the Lord, the God who answers with fire. He is God. All the people answered, that's fine. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Since you are so numerous, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. Then call on the name of your God, but don't light the fire. 1 Kings chapter 18 verses 23 through 25 After all the people agreed to the terms of the contest, what did Elijah allow the Baalists to do? Well, since they're so numerous, which is scary... Choose for yourselves one bowl and prepare it first. So it's interesting he lets them go first. What reason did he give for it? Because they're so numerous. Turn your attention inward now. Oh boy, here we go. For some self-evaluation. Write down a few sentences to describe how you normally react emotionally, physically, when you feel outnumbered or overwhelmed in some area of your life, especially when the stakes of what you're up against are particularly high. Um, emotionally, physically, I want to run away. 
I don't know about you, but yeah. Um, especially when I get difficult students, um, I just want to run away. But I'm not supposed to. But that's what I want to do. Now use the margin space to prayerfully expound on your answer. How do you re react to or treat the other people who are involved in those kinds of situations? Hmm. How do you feel about yourself at those times? Hmm. In situations like these, is it easy or fairly difficult for you to let others go first or take primary positioning? What do you think you'll lose if you defer to them? What does your reaction say about the state of your heart and about your confidence in the Lord? Okay, so there you go. Some hard questions to think about when you feel outnumbered, overwhelmed in your life, especially when stakes are high. Stakes are high, what you're against. How do you react and treat others around you? Hmm. I know how I am. Grumpy. How do you feel about yourself at those times? Mm, I don't feel very good. In situations like these, it is easy or fairly difficult for you to let others go first or take primary positioning. Mm, I think it depends on the situation. What do you think you'll lose if you defer to them? Mm, control. Hello. And what does your reaction say about the state of your heart? I kind of want to control things. And about your confidence in the Lord, he's in control. That was my dog. So, yeah, she's whiny. Page 137. Even though there were other Israelites on Mount Carmel that day, Elijah was the only one who was unapologetic and verbal about his complete allegiance to Yahweh. He was, in essence, outnumbered 850 to 1. He certainly felt that way. I am the only remaining prophet of the Lord, he said in 1 Kings 18.22. Despite this, he willingly deferred to his adversaries in this contest, allowing them the first opportunity to invoke the fiery response of their God. The question is, though, why? Why would he do this, and how? How can he muster up the courage and confidence to do it? With such grand odds at stake and in such a highly intimidating environment, how could he show no signs of concern or worry or insecurity, even while giving his opponents the seeming advantage of going first? Well, it's because of something he knew, and I mean really knew. It's the one thing I want you to walk away from today's devotional, believing and consistently incorporating into your reactions toward the overwhelming circumstances in your life, and here it is. The perceived advantage of being first is always trumped by the actual advantage of having access to God's fire. When you know that God is for you, when you know his spirit lives within you, when you are convinced, as the gospel says you can be, that his favor and presence rests upon you, you are no longer consumed with insecurity about the odds that may be stacked against you. Neither the best, nor the biggest, nor the first is any comparison for having God's blessing and backing. So the real question becomes this. Do you believe that your God is the one true God or not? Elijah knew the only fire that was going to fall that day would be coming from Yahweh's hand. He knew it. That's why an absolute confidence could brim within his heart. That's my dog. His willingness to wait, defer, and lead from a position of humility communicated the assurance of his conviction. He basically said, you take first, I'll take the fire. Okay, page 138. Skim back through the previous couple of paragraphs, and if you didn't already, highlight or underline any portions that bring to mind and resonate with circumstances, with circumstances you're facing in your life right now. Pause and ask the Holy Spirit to speak to you in regard to what he's showing you. Excuse me. So think back over the last few days. Evaluate what your recent actions, attitudes, and responses to others have been reflecting about your confidence in God or lack thereof to fight for you, protect you, and pave the way for you. Hmm. Here you go. So use the chart, so there's a chart below, to record some of your specific behaviors and what they reveal. I've given you an example from my own life to start. It says, sometimes I insert myself into a conversation. 
why I don't fully trust God to make room for me. So that's kind of her thoughts on that. So just think of some examples in your own life, um, recording some of your behaviors, what they reveal about yourself. This principle we're studying today about having confidence in God, despite being outnumbered or overwhelmed, can be seen in many different scenarios throughout the scriptures. For example, Goliath was much bigger than David, but David had God on his side. You come to me with the sword and with the spear and with the javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, 1 Samuel seventeen forty-five. Joseph was outnumbered and overpowered by his big brothers, and yet God's favor and blessing rested on him as a younger brother, so that even when they planned and executed evil against him, God turned it around for good. Genesis 50, 20. What other biblical examples come to your mind that underscore this principle? I've listed a few in the margin to spur your thinking. Why do you think God would make them this theme so prevalent and repeated in Scripture? So some examples she has is Joshua against Jericho, Joshua 6, 1 through 5, Samson against the Philistines, Judges 16, 21 through 30, Nehemiah against his opponents, Nehemiah 6, 1 through 9, and Paul against a storm at sea, Acts uh, chapter 18 verses 8, no, Acts chapter 27 verses 18 through 25. So when you think about it, you know, Joshua, um, they weren't supposed to take weapons. They were supposed to take those clay lamps and march around the city of Jericho. They weren't supposed to do anything until, what was it, the seventh day? I don't remember. I should really look it up. And they had to uh, shout, was it shout, blow trumpets, and then hit their pots. Somebody tell me. No. I can't hear you. That's right, because... You're in YouTube land. Okay, here it is. It's in Joshua. Joshua is a great book. If you've never read Joshua, you should read it. Um, one through five. Let's get everything correct. Now, Jericho is tightly shut up because of the Israelites, because they were scared of them. No one went out and no one came in. And then the Lord said to Joshua, See, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram horns in front of the ark, the ark of the covenant. On the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpet, have all the people give a loud shout, then the wall of the city will collapse and the people will go up and every man straight in. Okay, so maybe not hitting clay pots. Hmm. I'm just going to keep reading. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the people, Advance! March around the city with the armed guard going ahead of the Ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the Ark of the Lord's Covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guards followed the Ark. All this time, the trumpets were sounding, but Joshua had commanded the people, Do not give a war cry. Do not raise your voices. Do not say a word until the day I tell you to shout. Then shout. So he had the ark of the Lord carried around the city, circling it once, and then the people returned to camp and spent the night there. I'm just going to keep going. Joshua got up early the next morning, and the priests took up the ark of the Lord. The seven priests carrying the seven trumpets went forward, marching before the ark of the Lord and blowing the trumpets. The armed men went ahead of them. The rear guard followed the ark of the Lord while the trumpets kept sounding. So on the second day, they marched around the city once and returned to the camp. They did this for six days. On the seventh day, they got up at daybreak, marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day, they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around, when the priests sound the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, Shout, for the Lord is giving the city. The city and all that is in it are to be devoted to the Lord. Only Rahab, the prostitute, and all who are with her in her house shall be spared, because she had the spies we sent. But keep away from the devoted things, so you'll not bring about your own destruction by taking any of them. Otherwise, you'll make the camp of Israel liable to destruction and bring trouble on it. 
All the silver and gold and the articles of bronze and iron are sacred to the Lord and must go into his treasury. When the trumpet sounded, the people shouted. And at the sound of the trumpet, when the people gave a loud shout, the wall collapsed. So every man charged straight in and they took the city. They devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men, women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. Okay, so there you go. So the clay pots must be something else. Is that Gideon? Anybody? Does anyone tell me? Okay. I think it might be Gideon now. But anyways, um, you know, they wanted to fight. They wanted to go to war. But God said, no, you're going to do it my way. So they were weak. Um, they were forced to be weak. They were forced to not do the battle cry and all that stuff. They had to do it God's way. And I love that. Um how many times have you been forced to do it God's way? Think about that. And sorry about my hair. I just The humidity and heat is awful. My hair is just doing weird things. But anyways, how many times have you been forced to wait on God and do it his way? You know, we should do it every single day, every moment of our lives, wait on God. But we don't. But we should. It's really hard. But we should. Uh, his way is always better. It's always perfect, and it's always for our good. Even though you might doubt it, it's always for good. So anyways, I love that story. It's a good story. Okay, so, oh, it's Gideon. Here it is. Take a peek at one of my favorite Old Testament examples. This is Priscilla. Judges 7, chapter 7, verses 2 through 9, which chronicled the fame beginnings of Gideon's battle against 140,000 Midianite soldiers. So Judges. Judges comes after Joshua. Yep, there it is. That's a miracle. I actually found it. Okay, chapter 7, verses 2 through 9. All right. Oh, yeah. So, the Lord said to Gideon, You have too many men for me to deliver Midian into, your, into their hands, in order that Israel may not boast against me that her own strength has saved her. Announce now to the people, anyone who trembles with fear may turn back and leave Mount Gilead. So 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. But the Lord said to Gideon, there's still too many men. Take them down to the water and I will sift them for you there. If I say, this one shall go with you, he shall go. But if I say, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So Gideon took the men down to the water, and there the Lord told him, Separate those who lap the water with their tongues like a dog from those who kneel down to drink. Three hundred men lapped with their hands to their mouths. All the rest got down their knees to drink. And the Lord said to Gideon, Okay, with the three hundred men that lapped, I will save you and give the Midianites into your hands. Let all the other men go, each to his own place. So Gideon sent the rest of the Israelites to their tents, but kept three hundred who took over the provisions and trumpets of the others. Is that as far as she said? To... Nope. Now the camp of Midian lay below him in the valley, and during the night the Lord said to Gideon, Get up, go down against the camp, because I'm going to give it into your hands. And there it is. And so he does. That's my dog. She's so white because she hasn't seen me all week so sorry but I feel bad about kicking her out if she gets worse I'll kick her out so uh yeah Gideon first question how did the Lord describe Gideon's original army it's too big too many he's got too many verses three through eight do the math how many men did Gideon start with so he had he had 40,000, he had 22,000 men left while 10,000 remained. So he had 32,000. How many did he end up sending home? All of them, except for 300, 300 men. What was Yahweh's promise to Gideon and his small army in verse 9? Get up, go down against the camp because I'm going to give it into your hands. There you go. Simple as that. 
My favorite portion of this passage is found in that second verse, when God said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give Midian into their hands. In other words, the more resources Gideon had at his disposal, the less of a victory he'd experience. Having more was actually working against him. Did you catch what I said? Having more actually worked against him. Page 140. I am floored by this. I often wonder how many times I refuse to release things from my life that, at the time, seemed advantageous or even necessary. In hindsight, though, I realize they were actually acting as repellents to the fire of heaven that God wanted to give. I continually, continually try to remember what God told Gideon to do. I will deliver you with the 300 men, so let all the other people go. Translation, don't be afraid to have fewer. Don't be afraid to go second. Don't be afraid to look weaker by comparison. I've got your back and you've got my favor. That's all you need on your side to secure the victory. That's where Gideon got his confidence. Where Elijah got his confidence. Where you and I can get your our confidence too. And when we're confident with that kind of confidence, we don't need to gather more reinforcements or go first or maneuver ourselves into a favorable position for outsmarting and outperforming everybody else. Instead, we can walk into any situation with authentic humility, which is one of the key elements that invites the fire of heaven. Our flesh is so easily tickled toward pride and self-sufficiency that we instinctively lean toward wanting to be first, to be the best, to have the most. So God, in order to curb this tendency of ours, often allows us to enter situations where the odds are tilted against us, where we're liable to experience a frightful twinge of insufficiency. But rather than avoid these moments, be like Elijah. Embrace them as an opportunity to practice humility, to defer to others, and to refuse succumbing to insecurity. Don't back down and run away from the hard things. Believe instead that God can do unbelievable things in the face of them. As you close today's lesson, read the following verses slowly and out loud. Choose one to write on a 3 by 5 card and post where you'll see it regularly throughout the next week. Ask the Lord to cement its truths into your heart. Then ask him to help you be able to react, respond, and relate to others with a greater sense of confidence in who he is and what he can accomplish for you can accomplish on your behalf so psalm 73 i am watching yes it is recording i'm so glad psalm 73 verses 23 through 26 psalm 73 i'm close no i'm not that close psalm 73 verses 23 through 26 oh yeah that's right 23 through 26 Yet I am always with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. Am I reading the right ones? I am. Verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail. But God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So true. Second Corinthians chapter three. So go to the New Testament. Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh, what song is in my head? I don't know it very well. I should work on it. Roman through Romans. Do 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 do. Okay, hold on. Second Corinthians chapter three, verses four and five. Okay, and here we are. Such confidence as this is ours through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. Okay. So, <clears throat> there you go. In the end, you can have all the pride and all the stuff in the world and the new house and the new, I don't know, boat. Seems like a lot of people have boat. Um, whatever, your second house, your third house, your twelfth house, I don't know. Um, but after watching my mom pass, she had nothing left. She had zero things left. She had a few clothes. She had um, a Bible. 
she had some lotions, she had her wig, um, and a purse. And that was about it. That is all she had at the end of her life. And not one of it went to heaven with her. Not a one. And so it's really, it just puts on my heart that, you know what, it's just stuff. Um, it's just stuff, and this stuff is not even really my stuff. It's God's stuff. And it is my bountiful, loving, humble, blessed God who's sharing his stuff with us, with me, with you. Um, and we're asked to take care of it, in other words, as in to share and give to others. So um, just watching my mom the last four years, you know, I, I think she finally understood it by the end. Um, she struggled. She was an only child. She was used to always having her stuff her way all the time. And um, But those last four years of life, she just was like, it, it's all meaningless. Nothing matters but God. So there you go. So I hope this study was a good one. And have a happy Labor Day weekend. And I will see you again. Thank you for sticking it out and coming back. Thank you for your comments. Um, such rich, thoughtful comments just add so much. And it's comments I need to hear and I appreciate. So have a wonderful Labor Day weekend and we'll see you again. Thank you.